He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Yep. And cover. Be sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. First, you have to know what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. You will know when it comes. We hope it never comes, but we must get ready. It looks something like this. There is a bright flash, brighter than the sun, brighter than anything you've ever seen. If you are not ready and did not know what to do, it could hurt you in different ways. It could knock you down hard or throw you against a tree or a wall. It is such a big explosion, it can smash in buildings and knock signboards over and break windows all over town. But if you duck and cover like Bert, you will be much safer. You know how bad sunburn can feel. The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn, especially where you're not covered. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck and your face. Duck and cover underneath a table or desk or anything else close by. This is what to do if you should be in a corridor. You duck and cover tight against the wall this way. Remember to keep your face, the back of your neck, covered tightly. Try to fall away from windows or doors with glass in them. Then, if the glass breaks and flies through the air, it won't cut you. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. Paul and Patty know what to do. Paul covered the back of his head so that he wouldn't be burned, and Patty covered herself with the coat she was carrying. They knew how to duck and cover. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. At a boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Tony knows that it helps to get to any kind of cover. This wall was close by, so that's where he ducked and covered. Duck and cover. This family knows what to do, just as your own family should. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. Even a newspaper can save you from a bad burn. But the most important thing of all is to duck and cover yourself, especially where your clothes do not cover you. But there might not be any grown-ups around when the bomb explodes. Then you're on your own. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? So it's worth pointing out that if you lived in a major American city, it's more than likely that duck and cover wouldn't actually protect you from a nuclear blast. The closer you were to the epicenter of an atomic bomb, the less things like building walls or furniture would shield you from the bomb's effects. If you lived further out, like in the suburbs, for example, then duck and cover very well could protect you from hazards like radiation burns and glass from broken windows. Duck and cover drills represent just one way that science and technology radically changed American society and culture in the post-war era. Before World War II, the idea that a single bomb could completely destroy an entire city was beyond the realm of science fiction. But after 1945, industrialized nations around the world began planning for the eventuality of nuclear warfare. This arms race is just, again, one of several ways that science and technology substantially changed American life over a very short period of time. And for today's lecture, we're going to be looking at some of these changes, as well as how Americans reacted to them. But first, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss our class quote for the day. This one is by a guy you likely already know about, Fidel Castro. And he says, quote, I propose an immediate launching of a nuclear strike on the United States. The Cuban people are prepared to sacrifice themselves for the cause of the destruction of imperialism and the victory of world revolution, end quote. Oftentimes when we look back on history, we fall into this trap of relying on our hindsight bias and forgetting the people who came before us didn't know how things would eventually turn out. Right? We ask things like, how could people side with the Soviet Union, which had a system of forced labor camps spread throughout the country and stifled internal dissent? Or how could people think that global communist revolution was just on the horizon? None of these individuals knew how the Cold War would turn out or what we would eventually learn about the Soviet Union after that country collapsed. Similarly, when we ask 
how we came so close more than a handful of times to blowing ourselves up as a part of this arms race, it's because the people in charge didn't know how close to the cliff's edge they truly were. They were in a sense walking blind. But let's spend this lecture talking about that, cl that cliff's edge, right? Let's have a discussion about science and technology. Before we jump into things though, let's take a moment to reflect on some of the information we may have already forgotten from our previous lectures and class readings. Americans benefited from new post-war technologies that made labor saving appliances and entertainment mediums more accessible to working class families. While inventions like the refrigerator, the gas stove, or the television all existed prior to the start of World War II, it wasn't until the post-war era that these luxury items were widely affordable for, for purchase. New post-war technologies didn't arrive unaccompanied though. While new appliances and consumer goods elevated the living standards of many Americans, the period also saw heightened anxieties brought on by Cold War conflicts. The television is just one example allowed Americans to tune into Joseph McCarthy's incendiary speeches about secret communists in the US State Department, which helped to extend the Red Scare's longevity. However, the television also enabled many Americans to tune in and watch the 1954 Army McCarthy hearings, which in many ways served as a catalyst for the decline and eventual end of the Red Scare entirely. And fears of Soviet hostility and expansion led federal policymakers to adopt strategies of containment and rollback to challenge the spread of international communism, which meant America was far more involved in international affairs than it had been previously. Looking at our lecture today, we're gonna to break everything down kind of into four main topics. First, we're gonna look at nuclear technology and American life. We'll also take a look at nuclear technology and it's a impact on the arms race. Then we'll kind of step back to how the Cold War influences involvement in outer space and the space race. And then we'll kind of wrap things up with Rachel Carson in a book that she writes in the early 1960s that changes how Americans view science and technology called Silent Spring. Let's jump back to that duck and cover video we saw at the start of the lecture, right? And this is again just one example of how that post-war technology is changing American society and culture. Schools and workplaces ac across the country had to grapple with the new very real reality that the United States and Soviet Union might actually go to blows in another third world war in which at least after 1950, both sides had access to nuclear arsenals. With the world witnessing how destructive atomic weapons were on cities at the end of World War II, efforts were undertaken in both the United States and the Soviet Union to prepare their populations to survive a nuclear attack. This was done with the hope that after the dust had finally settled, their respective populations and infrastructure would be in a better position to help them win the war, you know, a war that is inevitably fought in irradiated dust. We've looked at some of these changes outside of duck and cover drills already, you may remember, when uh, we talked about Eisenhower's creation of the interstate highway system, federal regulations specified that highways needed to be flat and straight enough so that the majority of roadway services could be used as impromptu runways in the event that Soviet troops ever tried an actual invasion of the United States, or if there was an insurrection uh, that meant the US lost control of a large amounts of its territory. Civil defense shelters began to be constructed throughout cities and towns. These shelters were deeper and more reinforced than normal air raid shelters built during World War II and were meant to withstand atomic bombs, though they would prove pretty useless in a direct hit. Many Americans were worried that civil defense shelters would be inadequate uh, for housing the general population of a city or town, and that might not turn out very well when the bombs started to fall. So many families start to actually building fallout shelters and bomb shelters on their own property with the idea of protecting their families if nuclear war ever broke out. Scientists initially viewed nuclear weapons as a potential positive for the world. Both Ike Eisenhower at a speech to the United Nations in 1953, as well as other scientists elsewhere argued that nuclear power could forever make electricity quote, too cheap to meter. In addition to providing the world with assurances of access to cheap, affordable electricity, the Atoms for Peace program even supposed the creation of infrastructure projects where nuclear weapons could be used in landscaping efforts the same way dynamite, dynamite had started to be used a century earlier, right? Why settle with just one Panama Canal when you could have two or three or four, all made possible by nuclear weapons technology? 
With the spread of nuclear weapons to the USSR and other countries later on, though, scientists and other public officials became more pessimistic about the prospects for peace in a nuclear age. Starting in 1947, scientific officials began pro a project known as the Doomsday Clock. It wasn't a physical clock. The Doomsday Clock was actually a metaphor used to uh, reflect the substantial threats posed to humanity from unchecked scientific advances in technology. At different times, the minute hand on the doomsday clock has been placed closer and farther away from midnight, which midnight represents the nuclear or some other form of technological apocalypse, right? If you're one minute to midnight, the world's about to end. If you're 15 minutes to midnight, you have a decent distance. In 1952, the United States tested the world's first hydrogen bomb. A hydrogen bomb is substantially different from the atomic bomb created in 1945 because, well, an atomic bomb relies on a much weaker fission reaction that breaks apart like these dense uranium or plutonium isotopes. Hydrogen weapons create a much more powerful fusion reaction when they unite two hydrogen atoms into one helium atom. A hydrogen or thermonuclear explosion is literally a recreation of the sun on Earth, and it's orders of magnitude stronger than an atomic explosion, as you can see in this, in this comparison picture here. The United States' first testing of a hydrogen bomb led scientists to move the doomsday clock to two minutes to midnight, the closest it has ever been to midnight in its history. Since 1953, the only time the doomsday clock has been placed at two minutes to midnight was in 2018. And that was after the scientific community condemned this continued lack of response by the international community to meaningfully address the problems posed by climate change. So there are new Cold War hostilities and, and this can put a damper on optimism surrounding things like atomic power, right? But the way nations developed and maintained infrastructure for nuclear power could cast even more doubt on the perceived ability of nuclear technology to benefit human society and solve humanity's problems. Starting in the 1960s, the United States government began granting licenses to private power companies to begin building commercial nuclear power plants. These plants could generate electricity more cleanly than traditional energy sources like coal or oil, and far more efficiently than other alternative energy sources like wind, solar, tidal, or even geothermal power. In Detroit, DTE, Detroit Thomas Edison, won the rights to build a power plant in Monroe County they called Fermi One. Construction began in 1956 and lasted until 1963 when the power plant was finally turned on in August of that year. One of the first commercial plants in existence, environmentalists were weary about the plant's safety, especially since the plant was built so close to the city of Detroit. Despite these concerns though, DTE officials continued to insist that Fermi One was safe and could be operated without any kind of concern. On October 5th, 1966, however, the Fermi One plant suffered a partial fuel meltdown where two of the plant's fuel assemblages were substantially damaged. Fermi One's shutoff mechanisms proved unresponsive and pressure began to build inside Fermi One's main reaction chamber. After a tense few days, workers at the plant were finally able to manually shut the reactor down, avoiding a total meltdown. Because there was no radioactive material dispersed into the environment, the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission did not require DTE to release information regarding the meltdown to the press, meaning that few people learned about the incident when it occurred. It took DTE scientists until 1970 to clean up the meltdown, and the plant was turned on briefly but shut back off permanently in 1972. It wasn't until three years later after that, in 1975, that the events of Fermi One became wider public knowledge when an author and journalist, John Fuller, published a book detailing the meltdown titled, We Almost Lost Detroit. Because Fermi One is a little bit to the west of Detroit, if a, if a nuclear meltdown were to actually occur at that plant, it is more than likely that wind currents and weather patterns would have carried the radioactive fallout right to the center of Detroit, meaning we would have had to have abandoned Detroit, like what's happened to other cities since then. In 1979, 
13 years after the incidents at Fermi 1, a different nuclear accident occurred at the plant at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. This accident grabbed national headlines when a similar partial meltdown and stuck valve let the plant to leak some radioactive material into the surrounding environment. Over the following days, the public watched the events at the plant unfold in the news, unsure if the workers at Three Mile Island would be able to get the plant under control and avoid a meltdown. While a meltdown was eventually avoided at Three Mile Island, the episode was a huge embarrassment for the government and the nuclear power industry, and many Americans began to question how beneficial nuclear power was in relation to its potential costs. Cleanup at Three Mile Island lasted until 1993, but even after that was completed, the plant was too damaged to resume operations afterwards. They had to just, they could never use it again. So we've had a lot of near misses in American history with nuclear power. What about elsewhere in the world? Well, in 1986, a full meltdown did occur at a nuclear power plant in the Soviet Union, outside the city of Pripyat in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Ukraine was like a kind of like a state within the Soviet Union that's since become independent. Known as the Chernobyl disaster, the Soviet government initially tried to cover up the accident. Soviet officials relocated the entire city of Pripyat while scores of engineers succumbed to nuclear sickness and poisoning while they tried to clean up and shut down the reactor. Truth about the events at Chernobyl eventually came out though, greatly embarrassing the Soviet government internationally. But perhaps more importantly, the incidents at Chernobyl led many Soviet citizens to distrust their government. Pripyat remains abandoned to this day, with scientists arguing the area may not be safe for humans to inhabit for at least several hundred years, if not several thousand. Some historians point to the Chernobyl disaster as the point where the Soviet Union finally started to unravel toward the end of the Cold War. That distrust of the government uh, that, that the Chernobyl disaster engendered in the Soviet citizenry was just too much. Since the Chernobyl disaster, proponents of nuclear energy have argued that the incidents in the Soviet Union only happened because of a lack of checks and balances in the Soviet political system. The idea is that because open dissent was not tolerated by the Soviet government, whistleblowers weren't able to call the state of Soviet nuclear power into question in time for needed life-saving improvements to be made on Soviet reactors. Chernobyl, it was argued, and sometimes is still argued, was an exception to the norm that was only made possible by the Soviet Union's repressive political system. This served as a decent explanation for some until similar incidents occurred in a multi-party democratic country, Japan in 2011. In that country, an earthquake and subsequent tsunami led to a critical meltdown near the city of Fukushima at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Like the Chernobyl disaster, the area around Fukushima may remain uninhabitable for hundreds of years to come. Incidents like these pose difficult questions, right? Nuclear energy is remarkably cheap and nominally the cleanest power option we have. However, nuclear energy also comes with inherent risks. These questions about science and technology remain as relevant today as they did in the 1960s and 70s. How much of our priority do we give to the economy's need for energy? This may be an easy answer for some until you add the complication that the same sources of energy needed for economic development can pose existential threats to human life and society. In May 2015, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission approved a combined construction and operating license for DTE to build a new plant that would be called Fermi 3. We currently have Fermi 2. Currently, DTE Energy says there's no plans for construction of Fermi 3, at least yet. So we've talked about how nuclear energy can be a mixed bag for American life, right? Cold War anxieties are amplified. The promises of nuclear power don't come off as beneficial once accidents in nuclear power start to occur. And American communities are altered as duck and cover raids, civil defense shelters, and backyard bunkers become commonplace. But nuclear technology also changes the way Americans see the world around them and how they should best interact with that world. Not long after the Guatemalan coup d'etat in 1956, remember this is Operation PB Success that we've talked about, a different Latin American revolution breaks out on the island of Cuba when 
Rebels sailing from Mexico on a stolen yacht land on the island and begin a guerrilla campaign to oust the pro-American dictator ruling from the city of Havana, Fulgencio Batista. Promising land reforms, voting rights, and other progressive changes, the group gains followers, and by 1959, the rebel band forces Batista to flee, bringing an end to the revolution. Almost immediately, this new Cuban go government is at odds with the United States, which saw the reforms promised by Fidel and his guerrilla band is pretty socialist. The head of the government, again, Fidel Castro, promised that he would respect the rights of Cubans. However, his government immediately began seizing private lands and nationalizing hundreds of private companies. In response to these actions, the Eisenhower administration imposes trade restrictions on everything going to Cuba except for food and medicine. The idea being if we can economically punish Cuba for these reforms, maybe they'll abandon them and kind of admit that they were wrong. Instead, though, the Cuban government reaches out to the Soviet Union for economic existence. And this prompts the U.S. to cut all ties with the Cuban government. Eisenhower, not wanting to appear weak on communism, but also recognizing the threat of a communist country 90 miles away from American shores, particularly uh, the coast of Florida, begins working with the CIA on a plan to get rid of Castro's government. Many refugees had begun fleeing Cuba as the government in Havana adopted increasingly invasive laws and restrictive regulations. And the CIA welcomed many of these refugees leaving Cuba and started resettling them in Mexico and parts of Florida. Promising to help them retake their country from Castro and with Eisenhower's approval, the CIA began training many of these Cuban refugees for an eventual invasion of the island. Now, Eisenhower left office early in January, 1961, without plans ever being carried out. However, after taking office, John F. Kennedy was briefed on this plan and without being given extensive details on the project, told the CIA to go ahead with it. On April 17th, the CIA landed approximately 1,500 trained Cuban exiles on the beaches of Southern Cuba in an area known as the Bay of Pigs. The Cuban exile fighters had orders to march on Havana and overthrow the Castro government. The CIA promised the Cuban exiles that they would be supplied by U.S. ships and that the U.S. Air Force would protect them. However, these plans never materialized. The U.S. had several bombers shot down, supply ships were sunk before they could land, and many of the Cuban exile fighters ended up landing in the wrong place and were cut off from others who were involved in the operation. Once U.S. involvement in the operation becomes internationally known and the tide begins to turn against the Cuban exiles, JFK orders that supplies and air support to the exiles be cut off. Now, the fighting continues for three days until the leaders of the invasion surrender. Most of the exile soldiers are arrested and sentenced to lengthy prison terms, though many are also executed by the Cuban government. Some soldiers continue to fight against the Cuban government in the mountains until the mid-1960s, However, after the first three days of the Bay and Pigs invasion, the U.S. really washes its hand of the project. Now, on October 15th, the next year, this is in 1962, government officials notified Kennedy that U-2 spy planes conducting reconnaissance over Cuba had photographed construction sites that bore an unmistakable resemblance to launch sites that were used to launch nuclear missiles in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. The USSR and Cuba had reached an agreement to install missiles on the island in response to the Bay of Pigs invasion the year earlier. Justification in building the nuclear missile launch sites in Cuba, Soviet leaders argued, was that the US would not invade the island now because it would risk starting another world war. US politicians held a very different view though. Before missiles were put in Cuba, the US had an advantage should the USSR ever try to start a nuclear war. This, the U.S. would have more time to respond to a Soviet attack since leaders would be able to see missiles coming if they're being launched from Eastern Europe or the Soviet Union. But if missiles were to come from Cuba, the U.S. would likely not be able to respond in time, right? Cuba was too close. These missiles are going to be hitting American cities too soon. We don't have a way to respond to these nuclear weapons. This divides American leadership. 
Because most of the missiles in Cuba were not operational by the time the launch sites were discovered, this meant the US might be able to invade the island before any of the missiles could be launched. There were some drawbacks to this plan though. If the U-2 spy planes missed any single one of the missiles, potentially covered by jungle foliage, or you know, maybe the U-2 spy plane just didn't see it and it was out in the open, it could be launched during an invasion. Now, today we have a lot of control mechanisms and a lot of software and a lot of navigation computing devices built into missiles, but once missiles were launched in the 1960s, there wasn't a way to stop them from hitting their targets. Because the launch sites were under construction while leaders in Washington were deciding what to do, politicians like JFK were operating under the knowledge that there was kind of a time limit on this option. As more and more of the missile sites on the island became operational, the potential of invading the island to get rid of the problem became less and less likely to not end in a nuclear exchange. On October 22nd, Kennedy addressed the United States and announced that an economic blockade would be placed by U.S. ships around Cuba, and that the U.S. Navy would not allow any foreign ship into Cuban waters unless it consented to be searched and no weapons were found on board. The Soviet Union announced they would not honor the blockade and that if they were fired upon, they would shoot back, likely starting a full-scale war. As Soviet ships began approaching the island and U.S. ship closed in, however, the Soviet Union backed down and honored the blockade. The U.S. brought photographic evidence of the Soviet buildup on the island, which the USSR had denied up until that point, and alleged that the Soviet Union was preparing for a first strike scenario against the United States. Nikita Khrushchev, the head of the Soviet Union, was outraged and he famously beat his shoe on the podium at the United Nations hearing and proclaimed to the American delegation, we will bury you. This did not work out well in the press for him. Despite the anger of Soviet diplomats, they, like Americans at the time, didn't want a nuclear war. While Kennedy's blockade of Cuba did not remove missiles from the island, it did prevent more launch sites from being built, giving the US and Soviet Union time to meet and negotiate an agreement to end the crisis. The Soviet leader, Khrushchev, and US President Kennedy wrote letters to one another over the following days, and diplomats between the two countries exchanged phone calls and lengthy and often tense negotiating processes. While all this was going on, American and Soviet jet planes began chasing one another over the Bering Strait, the sea lane that separates the state of Alaska from the Soviet peninsula of Kamchatka. Another U-2 spy plane flying over Cuba to perform additional reconnaissance was shot down. And this act alone prompted several military leaders to urge Kennedy to launch an attack on Cuba, but he didn't. In the meantime, there were other close calls that almost started a nuclear war, even though tensions were starting to ease a little bit with this negotiation process. On October 28th, the US Navy dropped a series of signaling depth charges on a Soviet submarine near the blockade line. This US Navy ship was unaware that the submarine was armed with nuclear tipped torpedoes and the officers on board the submarine were ordered to use them if they were attacked. Now the submarine was too deep to monitor radio traffic and the captain of the submarine believed that the war had already started between the United States and Soviet Union. And he wanted to launch his nuclear torpedoes against his targets, American cities. The decision to launch these required agreement from all three officers on board, however, and one of them, Vasily Arkhipov, objected. And so they did not launch their nuclear weapons and World War III was very narrowly averted. Ultimately, the Soviet Union agreed to withdraw their ICBMs and nuclear weapons from Cuba in exchange for some similar concessions from the United States. In return for the removal of Soviet missiles, Kennedy agreed to take down similar missile sites the US had installed in Turkey and Italy, and he made a solemn vow that the US would never invade the island of Cuba. Upon hearing the news though, Castro was furious. He viewed the compromise between the US and Soviet Union as a betrayal of the Cuban people and his revolution. Castro was convinced that the US would try to overthrow him again, and at the time believed the only way to stop the US domination of the world was through nuclear war. 
Now, in defense of Castro's viewpoint, throughout the Cold War, the CIA, like, tried unsuccessfully to assassinate him over 600 times. So clearly, they were trying to get rid of him. Um, nuclear war is, is kind of an escalation, though, right? The Cuban Missile Crisis is an example of what historians refer to as brinksmanship. Brinksmanship is the third of our four approaches that the U.S. uses to respond to communism that we're going to discuss this semester. And brinksmanship is this practice of trying to achieve an advantageous outcome in international politics and military strategy by pushing a, a dangerous event or a, or a dangerous conflict on to the brink of warfare. It often involves the threat of nuclear weapons too. Brinksmanship succeeds by pushing a situation with an opponent to the brink and then forcing them to back down and make concessions in order to avoid a nuclear uh, exchange. It's a lot like playing chicken, but with hydrogen bombs. Ultimately, the US and USSR back down and make concessions to end the Cuban Missile Crisis. No one country wins out here. And this leads many to question how worthwhile a policy like brinksmanship is now that nuclear weapons are a global reality, right? Back during World War I, brinksmanship was, if you don't do this, it's war. After World War II, brinksmanship is, if you don't do this, the world ends. Following the Cuban Missile Crisis, many US leaders and politicians would argue for different strategies when dealing with the Soviet Union and other communist countries like detente. That's the fourth strategy we'll discuss later on. So American and Soviet leaders eventually abandoned, uh, abandoned brinksmanship as a Cold War strategy, but the arms race would yield other lasting effects on American society and foreign policy as well. Khrushchev and Kennedy, fearing another missile crisis in the future, reached out to one another to negotiate the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which banned the atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. The US and USSR also created the Moscow-Washington hotline, a direct phone link between Moscow and Washington DC, so the two countries could talk directly to each other to solve any crisis that might come up in the future. Additionally, an active grassroots campaign to limit the construction of nuclear weapons and scale back the extent of the arms race began to grow internationally. The nuclear disarmament movement would go on to form the backbone of many peace movements later on. And our current peace symbol today actually comes from the nuclear disarmament campaign. If you see the image on the right here, uh, N for nuclear and D for disarmament are expressed by two naval uh, flag stances. And when they're combined together, they make the peace symbol you see on the far right. As the prospects of nuclear war became more, a more widely believed possibility, popular culture and perspective fiction changed as well. In the post-war era, dystopian fiction explodes as writers, filmmakers, and other cultural workers sought to critique the scientific excesses seen in the post-war age. Many of these dystopic plots centered around nuclear conflict. For example, the 1959 film On the Beach tells the story of a small Australian community in the months following World War III. The conflict has devastated the entirety of the Northern Hemisphere, killing all humans after polluting the atmosphere with nuclear fallout. The only areas still habitable are in the far reaches of the Southern Hemisphere, but air currents are slowly pushing the fallout south, meaning even as humans remaining on the Southern tip of the planet struggle to survive, they live with the knowledge that they will eventually become casualties of war as well. No one is assigned blamed for starting the war in the film. Instead, blame for the war is viewed as entirely unimportant. The film hints that the global annihilation may have arisen from a simple accident or misjudgment or a miscalculation by a computer. In either case, both the American capitalist system and the Soviet communist system will cease to exist along with the rest of humanity. Not a very happy idea for a film, right? So we've discussed how influential science and technology are for both American lives back home, as well as America's involvement in global affairs overseas. Specifically, nuclear weapons were created at the end of World War II with a specific threat in mind, that if the United States and the Allies didn't develop the atomic bomb first, then Nazi Germany or even Japan might. 
potentially changing the outcome of the war. During and after the war, the importance of being able to stay technologically ahead of one's adversaries was not lost on American leaders. In the closing days of World War II, as American and allied forces occupied Germany, many of Germany's leading scientists were given a choice. They could work in new scientific programs in the United States that American scientists were already working on, or they could remain in Europe, which was still struggling to overcome post-war poverty and start only starting its reconstruction efforts. This initiative would come to be known as Operation Paperclip, and it led many German scientists to immigrate to the United States. Among these scientists was Werner von Braun, who designed Nazi Germany's V-1 and V-2 rockets, kind of the forerunner to today's modern ICBMs. He would also later become the chief architect of the Apollo Saturn V rocket that lands Neil Armstrong on the moon. The Soviet Union also began bringing German scientists back to the USSR and had them work on a Soviet missile program. The first rocket made by joint Soviet and German scientists was the R-7, the world's first official ICBM, or Intercontinental Ballistic, Ballistic Missile. Well, the ICBM was designed to launch an atomic bomb from one part of the world to another without the need for bombers or airplanes, which could be intercepted and shot down. The Soviet Union quickly realized that they could use the R-7 for other purposes. Not only was the R-7 capable of leaving Earth's atmosphere, it could also leave the Earth's atmosphere fast enough to enter into Earth's orbit. Getting into orbit is more difficult than simply leaving the atmosphere because doing so requires a lot more speed and power behind your rocket, and you also have to be able to control your rocket's trajectory so it can enter an orbital flight path. Soviet scientists reasoned that they could, hypothetically, use an R-7, put a satellite on it, and then put that satellite into orbit by launching it. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union launches an, RCB, an R-7 ICBM from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, another one of these Soviet states. A small satellite, Sputnik, is put into orbit, prompting celebrations across Russia. The news is met with anxiety in the United States, though, which you may recall is still kind of embroiled in the Red Scare. A month later, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik 2. Instead of just a satellite, Sputnik 2 carries a dog named Laika, which becomes the first animal in space. The U.S. attempts to respond to these developments with its own rocket and satellite known as Vanguard. You may remember this from Ron Kovic's autobiography, born on the 4th of July. The U.S. attempts to launch Vanguard on December 6th of that same year, but the rocket's propulsion system fails and it blows up shortly after launch. The U.S. eventually does put its own satellite into orbit, but it doesn't take place until next year, and that satellite's named Explorer 1. In response to the success the Soviet Union was seeing in its Sputnik program, U.S. Congress passed legislation turning the previous National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, into the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. NASA is given responsibility for the nation's space program and in 1959 begins work on Project Mercury with the goal of putting a man in space. On April 12, 1961, however, the Soviet Union again shocks the world when it announces that they had successfully put a man in space and brought him back safely to Earth before the United States. Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space, became a national hero in the Soviet Union, which touted his 108-minute orbit as a victory for the communist system. The Soviet Union would ultimately build on its propaganda victories when, on June 16th, it sent Valentina Tereshkova into space in its Vostok 6 mission. This made Tereshkova the first woman in space. The U.S., it's worth, you know, it's worth mentioning, would not try to send a woman to space until 1983. In response to initial Soviet victories in the space race, JFK makes a famous commencement address at Rice University near Houston, Texas in 1962, where he challenged NASA to put an astronaut on the moon by the end of the decade, implicitly inviting the Soviet Union to attempt to beat them there. Quote, we chose choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. 
because the goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. While Soviet leaders never officially accepted Kennedy's challenge, U-2 reconnaissance planes flying over the Soviet Union quickly uncovered a massive Soviet space program that was, for all intents and purposes, designed to beat the U.S. to the moon. While the Soviet Union was working on their space program, the United States was making progress as well. In 1965 and 1966, NASA launched rockets as part of their ambitious Gemini program, achieving several space travel firsts. The U.S. space program performed the first docking between two ships in outer space when Gemini 6A and Gemini 8 rendezvoused in space in 1965. The first long-duration flights conducted in preparation for traveling to the moon were achieved in the Gemini program. These flights lasted a total of eight days for Gemini 5 and 14 days for Gemini 7. Also useful work outside a spacecraft was achieved in the Gemini 12 mission when astronauts completed research experiments amid a two and a half hour spacewalk. While these gains were being made, NASA scientists began constructing a heavy lift rocket that would be capable of taking astronauts to the moon. Their end product was named the Saturn V as it was developed after NASA's Jupiter rockets and it was subdivided divided into like five stages, so Saturn V. The first Saturn V rocket to leave Earth's orbit and orbit around the moon was the Apollo 8 mission, launched in 1968 and uh, returning to Earth before the end of December of that year. On July 16th, 1969, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Edwin Buzz Aldrin boarded the Saturn V that would carry them to the moon as part of the Apollo 11 mission. Apollo's lunar module successfully landed on the moon and on July 1st, 1969, Neil Armstrong became, became the first human to set foot on a body in space that was not the planet Earth. Like the arms race, the space race has a significant impact on American culture and society. Optimistic depictions of space travel and space ex exploration could counter the dystopian pessimism associated with the arms race and the potential for nuclear war. Popularly syndicated shows like Star Trek depicted a human race in the distant future, which had by eliminating social ills like poverty, racism, and resource scarcity, made war and conflict an antiquated thing of the past. It seems irrelevant today that the pilot in the original Enterprise in Star Trek was a Russian, but in the 1960s, that detail spoke volumes to the optimism that some had for humanity's future. Well, the space race itself was seen as a wider barometer for which the successes and abilities of competing capitalist and communist systems could be compared with one another. After the space race, both the US and USSR would begin cooperating with one another on joint peaceful missions to space, setting the groundwork for space operations today, like the International Space Station, and developing plans to land an international crew on the surface of Mars. So we've talked about how technologies like nuclear weapons affected both American society and international relations, how international rivalries could be funneled peacefully through competitions like the space race, but how about the environment? Oftentimes the benefits of technological advancement are contrasted with the well-being of the environment. How did these tensions play out in post-war American history? Well, in answering this, I'd like to direct you to a brief video about a widely used chemical that was hailed as a modern miracle after the war, but is nearly globally banned and outlawed today. And that is DDT. Pesticides weren't always thought to be harmful. To the contrary, in 1947, Time magazine carried an advertisement claiming DDT was good for people, homes, and farms. It took 20 years before scientists realized how dangerous it was. 
It begins with the war-born development of DDT, this diabolical weapon of modern science saved millions of humans, but killed billions of insects. Man, with this newly discovered force, has at long last gained the upper hand in our age-old struggle. Just like these mosquito larvae, it came from laboratories where top scientists from famous universities and from industrial and government organizations collaborated to develop something new and different. They succeeded. They perfected Pestroy, the most effective weapon man has ever wielded against insects. To begin with, this new pest killer is a DDT preparation. We realize what that means. Once a bug comes in contact with DDT, he's lost. All he has to do is just walk on any pestroid treated surface. DDT is absorbed through the feet and spreads throughout the insect's entire nervous system. The effect is disastrous. DDT seems to literally drive bugs crazy. But not for long. DDT next paralyzes. Then kills. In both its forms, powder and liquid, Pestroy means doomsday to us insects. For this new insect destroyer contains a lot of DDT, not just a little. Its DDT content is even higher than government specifications. But the really sure kill feature of this insect killer isn't simply that it contains DDT, it's the way that it makes sure that bugs get the DDT that's in it. The same deadly effectiveness of the liquid form is found in the Pestroy powder. It is so easy to apply because of a new efficient dispenser package. All people have to do is to press the patented top like this. It's a handful of concentrated death. This powder is truly activated. It contains stabilized pyrethrum, an ingredient which literally stampedes insects from their hiding places to bring them into contact with DDT, indoors or outdoors. Stirs them up, drives them out of cracks and crevices. With the possibility of a serious infantile paralysis epidemic, health authorities of the city of San Antonio, Texas, attacked the germ carriers throughout the city. With the war discovered DDT in special sprayers, Sections of the city are blanketed with the insecticide in the fight to stop the spread of the dread poliomyelitis. Every suspected spot is sprayed. Even the streams are disinfected, and in the parks and public places, children are forbidden to gather. Tons of DDT are used in this fight against the dread disease, whose principal target is the young. Again, war has contributed one of its discoveries to save life. From 1945 to 1955, annual pesticide use on farms went from 125 million pounds to over 600 million. Soon, government agencies began treating even the suburbs with DDT. People thought it was a good thing because they got action in solving a problem as they conceived it. They were, for example, complaining about mosquitoes. And if the spray truck came down the street, uh, they were told to just stay indoors for a few minutes and everything would be all right. So you had the government endorsing a product and you had the chemical industry pushing it very aggressively. There was a development program going on with, within the corporate system saying, uh, well, a little bit is good, but a lot more is much better, isn't it? Public health departments stage demonstrations to convince the public of DDT's effectiveness and safety. Enthusiasm for the chemical knew no bounds, and few were questioning the wisdom of such use. Public places and private backyards were being treated whether people liked it or not. In 1957, planes sprayed a Massachusetts bird sanctuary owned by Olga Hawkins, a friend of Carson's. In fury and desperation, Hawkins told her what had happened. 
the birds showed all the symptoms typical of DDT poisoning. Huckins knew that the planes would be back in spite of her protests. She asked Carson for help. Carson later remembered how the thought of a spring silent of birdsong had moved her to action. It was your personal letter to me that started it all. In it, you told what had happened and begged me to find someone in Washington who could help. It was in the course of finding that someone that I realized I must write the book. We have to remember that children born today are exposed to these chemicals from birth, perhaps even before birth. Now, what is going to happen to them in adult life as a result of that exposure? We simply don't know. This is one of the nation's best sellers, first printed on September 27, 1962. In her groundbreaking book, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson jolted a prosperous post-war America, a country confident that science and technology were leading the way to a future in which disease and hunger could be overcome. In no small part, thanks to a new generation of powerful pesticides. But in Silent Spring, Carson warned that progress had a price. These sprays, dust and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests and homes. Non-selective chemicals that have the power to kill every insect, the good and the bad, to still the song of birds and the leaping of fish in the streams. All this, though the intended target may be only a few weeds or insects. Through sheer determination, Carson participated in an hour-long CBS News documentary on pesticides. CBS reports, The Silent Spring of Rachel Carson. Which aired not long after Silent Spring became a national bestseller. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for all life? While Carson didn't contend that chemical insecticides must never be used, she faced harsh opposition. A spokesman for the chemical industry, Dr. Robert White Stevens. The major claims in Miss Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, are gross distortions of the actual facts, completely unsupported by scientific experimental evidence and general practical experience in the field. If man were to faithfully follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we would return to the Dark Ages, and the insects and diseases and vermin would once again inherit the Earth. And when CBS turned to government experts, the questions were many, but the answers few. Dr. Paige Nicholson, water pollution expert, Public Health Service. Do you know how long the pesticides persist in the water once they get into it? Not entirely. Do you know the extent to which our groundwater may be contaminated right now by pesticides? We don't know that either, nor do we know if concentration may be occurring in groundwater. There appears to be growing concern among scientists as to the possibility of dangerous long-range side effects from the widespread use of DDT and other pesticides. Have you considered asking the Department of Agriculture or the Public Health Service to take a closer look at this? Yes, I, 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 and I know that they uh, already are. I think particularly, of course, uh, since Ms. Carson's book, but uh, they are. Ms. Carson maintains that the balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature. Now, uh, to these people, apparently, the, the balance of nature was something that was um, repealed as soon as man came on the scene. Well, you might just as well assume that you could repeal the, the law of gravity. The balance of nature is built of a series of interrelationships between living things and between living things and their environment. You can't just step in with some brute force and change one thing without changing a good many others. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we must never interfere, that we must not attempt to 
tilt that balance of nature in our favor. But unless we do bring these chemicals under better control, we are certainly headed for disaster. Rachel Carson, author of the landmark book Silent Spring, started a revolution. During the 1950s, when crop dusting planes and insect sprays blanketed plants with DDT, Carson warned of the dangers of chemical pesticides. She warned of science's power to alter nature and called for government action to protect its citizens. Because of her courage, the disaster did not come to pass, and with Carson's words and spirit, the modern environmental movement was born. So in a lot of ways, the environmentalist movement has a long running history in the United States. The National Park Service, created under Theodore Roosevelt in the 1910s, came after conservationists like the Sierra Club lobbied the government to set aside federal lands for everyone to be able to enjoy. In the 1930s, the federal government undertook massive campaigns to limit soil erosion by working with growers to prevent over farming the soil, a process which had produced things like the Dust Bowl at the outset of the Great Depression. In a lot of other ways though, especially after World War II, the environmentalist movement found itself increasingly in opposition to more powerful interests of national security and profitable economic growth. Well, it had cost the government relatively little to set aside tracts of federal land for public use during the progressive era, and the government likely benefited from programs designed to limit soil erosion. Efforts by the environmentalist movement undertaken after World War II required more considerable sacrifices and thus could be more hard fought for environmentalists to win. Nuclear proliferation and the nuclear proliferation movement, which we've already discussed a little bit, is just one example here. Well, ideally there would be no need for nuclear weapons or a nuclear arms race, environmentalists and peace activists who lobbied the government to limit how much was being spent on nuclear arms and other tools of war, ran aground against some pretty entrenched arguments and interests that didn't want to scale back nuclear weapons production. Limiting nuclear weapons production in the US just meant the Soviet Union would gain an advantage in the arms race, it was argued. The idea was that the stronger the United States was, the less likely the Soviets would be to attack America first, starting a third world war. Similar logic, it's worth mentioning, was also used against non-proliferation and peace activists in the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain. If we stop building these missiles, America will have more than us and then we'll lose the war. Do you want that to happen? The campaign over DDT came up against similar obstacles. As pesticides and defoliants developed in World War II began to be sold commercially in the marketplace, many worried about potential long-term health hazards and other negative side effects that were not yet known or widely understood before these chemicals saw public use. At the same time, however, criticism aimed at the use of such pesticides and the massive corporations that made them ran up against popular narratives that science and technology were harbingers of an entirely new era where humankind had complete mastery over the Earth's environment and environmental systems. Stereotypes persisted that depicted critics of these new technologies as anti-progress or were in some other way subversive, and this could limit discussion and debate about the merits of certain technological advancements. As the video mentions in 1962, research scientist Rachel Carson began investigating the negative effects of one pesticide, DDT, on people, wildlife, and the environment. And she published her findings in her controversial book, Silent Spring. Pesticide companies responded to Carson's work by threatening her with legal action. DuPont, the main manufacturer of DDT and uh, the Vesicol Corporation, compiled extensive reports on Silent, Silent Springs press coverage and threatened to sue Houghton Mifflin, Carson's publisher, as well as The New Yorker and Audubon, unless their planned events that they had scheduled about Silent Spring were canceled. Attacks could also be personal. U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Ezra Taft Benson wrote in a letter to Eisenhower, who had just left the presidency, that because Carson was unmarried, but also physically attractive, she was, quote, probably a communist or a lesbian, end quote. In 1964, Carson died of a heart attack. This stemmed from complications with a cancer diagnosis, though this didn't happen before her research was vindicated by her peers in the fields of biochemistry and marine biology. <laughs> 
The negative effects of DDT were agreed upon by scientific consensus and use of DDT for agricultural purposes was formally outlawed in the United States in 1972. Since 1972, the international community has also adopted an agricultural ban on DDT. As a direct result of these bans, some species of birds that were nearing extinction, like the bald eagle, have seen promising trends in repopulation, and the life expectancy and welfare of agricultural workers has risen worldwide. In addition to the victories by individuals like Rachel Carson against the use of DDT, the environmentalist movement of the 1960s also achieved several legislative reforms that it had been fighting for for a long time. In 1970, environmentalists lobbied the Nixon administration to both establish the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, as well as pass the Clean Air Act of 1970. The Clean Air Act tasked the EPA with monitoring air quality standards and regulating air pollution. Despite concerns raised by industry leaders, economic growth accompanied po this pollution control, demonstrating that the economy did not necessarily need to be sacrificed in order to have a better environment. The Clean Water Act of 1972 was subsequently passed, expanding the EPA's domain to include overseeing and regulating water quality in addition to air quality. So how do we view science and technology? We've covered a lot in this lecture. We've talked about nuclear weapons and nuclear power and discussed their potential to shape not only America's place in world affairs, but American society itself. We've talked about how competitions like the space race, a source of incredible anxiety and fear at the outset of the Cold War, could also serve as sources of exceptional optimism and hope for humanity's future. We've looked at the emerging modern environmentalist movement, the activism of Rachel Carson, and how addressing concerns relating to the environment can either be straightforward or exceedingly difficult, depending on who stands to lose from changing how we interact with science, technology, and our environment today. Whenever we talk about how we interact with science and technology, its effects on the environment, how we use natural resources, and how these relationships affect everyday people, we have to keep in mind that the decisions we all land on as a society have to balance the interests of everyone involved. This is as true about debates over the construction of Fermi 1 and Fermi 2, or Fermi 3, and the use of DDT as an agricultural pesticide, as it is for folks today, right? For example, when we talk about the construction of oil pipelines, either through the tribal lands of Native American communities or under the Straits of Mackinac, we have to take other things that might not immediately strike us as being related to technology and the environment to consideration as well. How many jobs are lost from the closure of a pipeline and how much does the price of oil go up? How do these changes affect the growth of our economy? How do they compare to the price we might ultimately pay if there's another massive oil spill or perhaps alternatively another catastrophic nuclear meltdown? And on that note, what's more of a serious threat facing humankind? The emerging climate crisis that comes with burning fossil fuels on an unprecedented global scale or the potential for widespread nuclear meltdowns around the planet, which could potentially come with shifting all of our energy production to nuclear power? There isn't any straightforward answers to these kinds of questions. There aren't really many answers for this part of our history class here. And that's because this issue isn't quite history yet. It's still very much being decided. So as usual, if these types of questions are particularly interesting to you, you'll be happy to know that among our discussion board prompts that will be available for you to respond to for the week, one of them is gonna specifically address these sorts of challenges that humans face, right? How are we going to continue to fit uh, and meet our energy needs, uh, especially as the population on the planet continues to grow? How are we gonna continue to make sure that everyone has things that really only electricity can ensure we have, right? Things like clean drinking water, electricity, um, enough food uh, to feed everyone. How are we gonna meet these energy needs while also balancing the, uh, the environmental impacts uh, of the process of creating that energy, right? Especially when we're dealing with things like climate change. Should humans shift entirely over to nuclear energy so we can stop the process of global warming? Or is doing that going to unleash its own basket of problems that we're gonna have to deal with? If these, if these questions aren't easy to you, if they seem very nuanced and complicated, 
then that's good because it means you're approaching these issues from multiple different perspectives and you're taking multiple things into consideration when you're formulating your ideas. And that's really what we want to do in this class, right? So for the end of the week, make sure you post those, dis those two discussion board responses. Uh, one of them can be on uh, the prompt that will be about uh, environmentalism and science and technology, or if you don't want to respond to that, there are the other options, of course. Um, also, make sure you reply to some of your uh, to some of your of your colleagues. Keep that discussion going. Don't be afraid to uh, disagree uh, with someone's line of reasoning, or maybe ask for clarification on a point that someone raises. Uh, you know, as always, you know we do this respectfully, but don't be afraid to uh, to elicit more responses. Ask for more information or like their thought process. Right? How did you come to this uh, discussion in regards to this aspect of of what you just said? Right. Those sorts of conversations can be incredibly constructive. Of course, don't forget to do your readings. Uh, we are done with our autobiographies, or if you're not done with your autobiography, definitely do finish those up. Um, but for this week, we have chapters three and four of these United States, uh, and we also have two shorter articles, right? So we're tackling two chapters. We're going to add on some articles, but they're not going to be uh, very long, uh, especially with the assignment coming due up due at the end of the week. The two articles, one is by the Detroit Metro Times. It's about toxic waste and how it dispropor uh, disproportionately affects communities and families of color in the metropolitan Detroit area. But these kinds of problems can be seen repeating all across the country, right? It doesn't have to be Detroit. It can be Baltimore, or St. Louis, or Los Angeles, or uh, any large uh, urban area where, there, where we see disproportionate uh, environmental impacts affecting communities that are not predominantly white, right? So that article is there. We also have an article by the Washington Post about the Southern strategy. That one's gonna be particularly uh, important when you watch our other lecture, which is about the rise and fall of the New Deal coalition and kind of the wrap up of the Vietnam War too. So make sure you do those readings. Those will really help you kind of formulate your discussion board uh, responses and replies, but they uh, more than likely will also help you write that historical autobiography book report that is due on June 4th. Um, if you do need an extension, please make sure you're reaching out to me uh, with enough time in advance so we can work something out. Um, if you need any help, don't be afraid to reach out and ask. I am always available if you need it. Just uh, just let me know and we can uh, set aside a time to meet, um, or, you know, over Zoom or through changing uh, trading emails or Canvas messages, however works for you. Uh, but until then, I'm looking forward to everyone's book reports. I'm looking forward to reading some particularly insightful analysis of these books. Uh, I think they're both great, and I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say.